Hello. Thank you for joining us with the Asian American Solidarity Economies Project webinar. Uh, my name is Parag Kandar, and I am one of the co-facilitators, um, along with Yvonne Liu, of the series. We are so happy uh, to have a wonderful guests joining us, and we're looking forward to um, really active engagement from everyone um, who's tuning in today. So our Twitter hashtag for um, the uh, webinar is uh, hashtag Asian Solidarity. Please um, feel free to let people know that you're tuning in, anything that you're hearing um, from this, as well as um, questions, which we um, will reserve the last 15 minutes of the webinar to review. So we'll have a brief introduction of this project and uh, the Asian American Solidarity Economies Project. Then um, we will introduce our guests and um, have a conversation about uh, what is solidarity economy um, or solidarity economies, uh, and then uh, engage with your questions as well. Uh, so the Asian American Solidarity Economies Project started in 2016. Um, uh, Yvonne uh, and I started to talk about the range of practices that we heard about or knew um, in different Asian sending countries as well as in migrant populations in the diaspora, but we didn't see enough uh, documented or we didn't know the stories. And so we started to talk to different practitioners, organizations, um, both who work in solidarity economies, uh, work throughout North America and around the world, as well as uh, people who are engaged in Asian, Asian migrant communities throughout the United States, Canada, and other parts of the world. And the project is really um, an effort to bring together practitioners, both who work within these different modalities, as well as people who are working within community, um, to talk about and understand um, both the histories of this work, um, the fact that uh, people have been engaged in mutual aid, mutualism, cooperation, um, and uh, really looking at transformative ways in which we can work together um, and build a just society together. Um, maybe they're not always using the same terminology. Maybe sometimes um, they don't have um, all, you know, not connected to all the, the same networks. Um, but a lot of this isn't new. And so this was the foundation of this project and our effort also to connect um, people who really want to do this work within community. So um, that's the, a little bit of the genesis of this project. Um, we started this webinar series uh, this year. Um, with the idea that there's interest. And uh, we had more than 300 registrations for this um, webinar, so we're, we know that there's interest, and we're really excited to share this with everyone. Um, we have uh, four more webinars coming. Um, we'll send out information about the next webinars around um, introducing cooperatives, um, looking at legacy micro-businesses, looking at um, incubation of um, cooperatives, and a range of other things. So. Uh, we'll send out that information, um, and we also have a listserv uh, for people who are engaged in or interested in supporting Asian American Solidarity Economies work, which uh, we'll also send an invitation to that for everyone who's tuned in. Um, really briefly, we want to thank our partners for the webinar series, uh, the UCLA Asian American Studies Center, um, in which, for which um, uh, Yvonne is actually a fellow um, recognized for her work as an activist in residence. Uh, we were really proud about, and she's doing this work um, as well. She can talk more about that and, and studying some of these histories and trying to bring them up to light, which is really exciting. Um, and also um, National Coalition for Asian Pacific American Community Development, um, who initially supported this work and continues to be a wonderful um, supporter of our work in um, just trying to um, see this different way in which to engage community. So, um, we are really excited about using this webinar and the different things that we're doing to um, introduce practitioners. And uh, without further ado, I want to uh, introduce my collaborator, Yvonne Liu, uh, who will just uh, give you a little bit of background, too. Thank you. Yvonne? Great. Thanks, Prague. Um, so yeah, I think, um, you know, as Prague mentioned, um, we've been gathering um, Asian American organizations who are interested in developing a different type of economics. Um, and in the process, we've also been realizing that um, these practices 
while to some extent some people might say oh you know like what is solidarity economy what does this have to do with my community like actually in fact um, there's long histories of these types of practices in our communities um, and they have long histories they, they were practiced by our ancestors in our home countries and um, folks brought these practices here when they immigrated here um, and a lot of these practices really kind of concentrated and deepened um, because of the various exclus exclusion acts and um, you know sort of racist um, barring of Asians from um, owning land to joining labor unions um, from the, the 19th to the 20th century. Um, and, and these practices continue today. So um, we've recognized some of these practices as, um, as being aligned through three forms of solidarity. The first being through kinship ties, the second being through ethnic solidarity, and then the last being through um, labor solidarity. So in terms of um, ethnic, excuse me, kinship ties, so there's lots of examples of family associations. Um, I think probably the most of the literature speaks to Chinese family associations, which started in you know the the late 19th century or the mid to the late 19th century, where um, family associations would actually set people to meet people when they were leaving the boat in San Francisco, for instance, um, to bring new immigrants to the association building and to give them housing, to give them um, access to to shelter and also to employment. Um, and then there's con continued examples of these family associations, um, like they've they've also led into building of um, national credit unions and insurance companies. Um, another form of um, kinship solidarity is rotating credit associations. Again, this is an example that's found in many different cultures. This is where there's um, a lump sum that everybody contributes into and then that money gets dispersed to each member um, over the course of sometimes a year. Um, so this, this has roots in Chinese, Japanese, um, and Korean traditions, and it's being practiced, for instance, today among um, Korean women who work in nail salons, you know, who don't have access to formal financial institutions and banking. Um, second, in terms of ethnic solidarity, so we have mutual aid associations and benevolent societies. So um, there's examples, again, in many different cultures. Um, in the Filipino experience, this started in the 1930s when Filipino immigrants arrived here and organized themselves in work gangs under a leader who spoke the same language. Um, and people shared resources. Um, they would pay each other's medical bills if somebody was penniless um, and covered expenses for each other. Um, this was also started more recently in um, 1980s by the Hmong community. Um, they started the Lao Family Community Incorporated um, as a mutual aid association to support members that were immigrating to this country after the Vietnam War. Um, and then lastly, in terms of labor solidarity, we have examples of many types of cooperatives in many different sectors. So um, there's a history of um, agricultural cooperatives in the Sikh and Japanese community in the early 20th century, mostly on the West Coast. Um, also during World War II, Japanese Americans operated consumer cooperatives in internment camps. The most famous was um, a consumer cooperative, Jerome Cooperative Enterprise in the Arkansas detention camp, um, which expanded to not only sell general goods, but also operated a dry cleaner, shoe repair, and other types of services. Um, and then during, um, during the 1960s, um, out of the social movements that, that um, launched the Third World Strike in um, the San Francisco Bay Area to demand for ethnic studies, um, a group of students and community organizers started the San Francisco um, Garment Cooperative. Um, so they were inspired by the Black Panthers who talked about um, black power as being also economic power um, and also inspired by the examples of black cooperatives in the South and cooperative models in China. So they set up a cooperative garment factory um, and the worker owners were Chinese and Filipino women. And the factory was actually located on the first floor of the International Hotel next to a cooperative bookstore and community center. Um, and it's very, very exciting history. So clearly there's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a long tail to two solidarity economies in our communities um, and, you know, current practice as well. Um, so with us today, we have 
uh, two speakers. We have Emily Kawano. Um, she's the co-director of the Wellspring Cooperative Corporation, which seeks to corp in create an engine for new community-based job creation in Springfield, Massachusetts. Emily also serves as coordinator for the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. Um, Emily is an economist by training and served as the director of the Center for Popular Economics from 2004 to 2013. Prior to that, she taught at Smith College. And our second speaker is Julia Ho. Um, Julia is the founder of Solidarity Economy St. Louis. Uh, during the Ferguson uprising in August 2016, she worked with Missourians organizing for reform and empowerment. And for the past two and a half years, Julia has been building a network of businesses, organizations, um, and individuals fighting for a just and sustainable economy. So I'm going to hand this back to Prague. Thanks so much, Yvonne. Um, as uh, listeners will know, or we'll, we'll figure out very quickly, especially if you tune in um, you know, to more of these webinars, the two of us like to nerd out on this stuff and, and we love it. It's wonderful. And, and uh, you know, we, we've got uh, incredible guests who I think will also nerd out with us a bit. So um, we were thinking about this being um, uh, a conversation. I've got some questions and then you know, um, please feel free to, to, um, to talk to one another as well. Uh, dialogue is really um, very generative um, and has been just in planning for this. Um, so my first question is just, um, what is your point of entry into solidarity uh, economy or solidarity economies work? Um, Emily, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Thanks. So thanks for organizing this. It's so impressive. I see that we've hit over 100. So that's so exciting. Uh, so let's see my entry. Uh, probably there was a there was a kind of long lead up of becoming aware, but the more um, concrete entry was, I was a director of the Center for Popular Economics. And uh, we, we, our work is to try to help people understand how the economy works, and in particular, understand capitalism. Our target audience are um, grassroots activists. And I think we did a real bang up job um, critiquing capitalism. But often at the end of all that, you know, sometimes people felt left feeling kind of dispirited, um, like it's so monolithic and the forces that we're up against are kind of overwhelming. And while we always had a session to talk about um, what's the alternative, we were not satisfied. And so we were looking for a better way to help people engage and envision what is the alternative. And that led us eventually to start the economy. Um, and I would say that when it, that it worked. It, it worked as a as a way of helping people grapple with this issue, and present it in a in a kind of very broad way. That's big tent. That's not um, saying it's this model or that model or just this way is right or that way is right. So, um, yeah, that was certainly um, my and sort of formal entry into the solidarity economy sphere. Thank you, Julia. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Julia Ho, based in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I did not grow up in St. Louis. I actually uh, grew up in West Texas, a place called Lubbock. It's like big football, very conservative, coll you know, college town kind of place. Um, but before that, my roots are really in Taiwan. Um, my family is Taiwanese. And um, over the years, it's taken me a while. And actually, through this project, through meeting Prague and Yvonne, um, I've started shifting the way that I talk about why I entered Solidarity Economies, um, focusing less on sort of the activism and the organizing and the groups that I got involved with in St. Louis and focusing more on my family history um, and my personal story and sort of what personally got me involved. So, um, you know, there's a number of things I did when I moved to St. Louis. Um, to go to school, you know, that got me involved with Solidarity Economies. Part of it was um, an interest in urban farming. Um, part of it was an interest in community organizing and direct action. Part of it was environmental sustainability and um, actually operating and starting a, a free store on my campus where we just had, you know, access for free stuff that students could take. Um, and not just students, but people in the community, you know, um, faculty members, workers on campus, that kind of thing. Um, but before all of that, 
my real roots in the solidarity economy um, stem from my mom. And, you know, my mom is to this day the most avid, um, uh, like, I guess, advocate or activist for food justice and um, organic farming and sustainability that I've ever met. <laughs> um, and so we actually, uh, growing up, had a over 200 acre organic farm, certified organic farm in West Texas um, that, you know, uh, over the course of its history, you know, my sister worked there for a while. It was very much integrated into my family. Um, but we had a CSA program, a shares program where people could, you know, pay a certain amount for the season and get and come and get fresh produce every week. Um, we had that fed like hundreds of families. We were sourcing the grocery stores in Lubbock. Um, my mom started community gardens at my elementary school, other elementary schools, and was always like just gardening everywhere. Like I remember um, driving around with her and she would like every time we would go somewhere she'd have to make like two or three stops just to like pick some pears at this garden or talk to a friend here um, and so that's really my when I think about you know what I do now as a community organizer I think about my mother and I think about the the things that she showed me um, through the way that she was part of that community and her passion for farming and food and health um, so all of those things are a part of what I do now and um, becoming more and more a part of what Solidarity Economy is about too. Thank you. Thank you both um, for sharing. Um, I, we think that, uh, you know, the points of entry and, and how we journey here are, are really important, particularly, you know, as there's so many people who are trying to figure out, you know, how do, how do I fit and, and what is the, what, what is it that makes sense? So we appreciate your, your sharing. Um, so this webinar is called Introducing Solidarity Economies. So what is Solidarity Economies? What does that mean to you? Um, Chile, do you want to start? Sure, I can start. Um, so Solidarity Economies, uh, I think the more you get into it, and Yvonne was touching on this, there's a lot of um, a lot of terms and a lot of uh, movements out there that fit into what Solidarity Economies are about. So some people have heard about cooperative economics. I think that is a term that is um, in lots of ways really rooted in um, like black economic empowerment um, and sort of cooperative economics that were practiced. Like, you know, you're mentioning rural co-ops in the South. Um, there's alternative economics, there's new, you know, new economy. Um, the reasons why I gravitate towards solidarity economy, um, well, two reasons why Solidarity Economy St. Louis specifically, um, one of the first gatherings I ever went to was in Jackson, Mississippi um, for Jackson Rising. And that was really, um, you know, just one piece of a really long history of, um, of uh, work and really amazing organizing happening uh, in Jackson to kind of overhaul their local economy. But we really wanted to focus on that because it was a form of solidarity with black communities in the US. Um, but also looking at solidarity economy as a whole, the reasons why I really focus on those terms is because one, it's a very transformative. Um, it goes what I view as one step a little bit further than a lot of the other kind of words out there. It's not really something that's supposed to be trendy. <laughs> it's really something that is supposed to um, encompass this idea of a, a radically different and a transformative vision of changing our economy that, you know, it's not just about sharing resources or, you know, feeling good. It's about actually changing entire societies and systems to meet the needs of everybody. Um, so that's one reason. And then the other reason is because solidarity economy is something that is really global. Um, and that extends beyond the US in really important ways, which I think is one reason why it's especially valuable for Asian Americans to identify with it because we can connect it so easily with um, our own cultures, our heritage, and also with other cultures around the world. Um, and solidarity economy is something that is very much um, becoming a global concept um, and not something that's restricted to us. In fact, if you really look at it, the US is like, super behind on pretty much anything related to the solidarity economy. So, um, but I think Emily can actually speak better to that. So I'll let her take that. Thank you. Yeah, Emily, I'm gonna take uh, what does solidarity economies mean to you? And, and also what is it, um, yeah, how does it fit in the United States context? All right. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna back out a little bit and, uh, and talk about 
um, RIPESS. So RIPESS, R-I-P-E-S-S, -S, is the International Intercontinental Network of the Solidarity Economy. And so um, U.S. Solidarity Economy is, uh, sits on the board of RIPESS, representing the United States. RIPESS went through a whole, let's see, it was a three-year process of developing a, a global vision statement because what we found as an international organization when we were talking about what is solidarity economy even this international organization network um, didn't have a clear foundation of, a, of agreement <laughs> of what it really meant and so we went through this long process um, and often we found that when there were disagreements, as we dug down into different terminologies, we found that there was a lot of alignment. So we set on, uh, we set on this journey um, to have this global conversation um, that involved um, continental and then regional and local conversations. Um, we had a draft document we circulated. It was also online. People could could um, respond directly online. So that was this whole process of draft, feedback, revision, more revisions. And then in the end, in at our, oh gosh, what year was it? Um, 20, maybe 2012, um, intercontinental meeting solidarity economy forum in Manila uh, we had a whole session to bring it together and and vet it um, and then that fed into the final draft so this this definition is fairly well vetted um, uh, and I just want to pull out so there's a long uh, there's a there's a document that people can access but I want to um, pull out a few pieces about that um, one, we became really clear um, that uh, solidarity economy is about creating uh, a post-capitalist um, economy, society, world. So that's really clear. And compared to a lot of other alternative economy um, uh, tendencies, uh, especially in the United States, solidarity economy is, is one of the few that's super, super clear about being, about trans, that about the position that we will not survive capitalism and we can do better and let's figure out how to, how to get beyond capitalism. So that's one thing. Another thing is that um, the issue of equity is really front and center and core in solidarity economy. And so it, it distinguishes us to some extent from also some of the other kind of um, green or, or local or just socially responsible, this, that, or the other. Uh, formations. So, um, for example, we think that co-ops, say worker co-ops are great, but if we're not also able to make worker co-ops relevant in um, low-income communities or communities of color, um, then we're not building the, the world that we're, we're saying that we're dedicated to. Um, the, in the, uh, in this Vigiper, we also embrace the um, the concept of Buen Vivir. If I'm not going to go into details, but within Buen Vivir, um, we also embrace a concept of the rights of Mother Earth, which says that nature has standing. Um, and so, again, I'm not going to go into great detail, but just to say that's a pretty it's a pretty radical framework. Um, uh, that's very interesting. So I wanted to, to say that that's, um, that's an element. Um, so that's what I'm going to pull out from the, the international uh, sort of perspective. And now I'm just going to quickly, um, because beyond that, uh, for example, the, the principles will look a little, little differently framed in each um, continent and to some extent in each country. Um, at the at the core of solidarity economy is it is a uh, a vision that's grounded in principles. So in the United States, the United States Solidarity Economy Network has five. 
Um, so solidarity, mutualism, cooperation, all that, that's one. Um, two is participatory democracy, so certainly not just voting uh, every once in a while, but you know, integrating democracy all throughout um, life and in particular the workplace. Um, equity, so we talk about equity in all dimensions, race, class, gender, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, sustainability. Um, and so there we're, we're really talking about environmental, ecological sustainability. Um, and the fifth one that we use is pluralism, which means that this is not a one size fits all. It will look different in different places, um, but there is this uh, common core of values, no matter how it's exactly, whether they have five or they have 10 or it's articulated in slightly different ways, it's basically a common core of principles across the world in solidarity economy. Um, let's see, so uh, can Yvonne, can you just flash the Prezi? Uh, so what this is, um, this is a Prezi that you can access. It's public. It'll take. It'll zoom in and out of different um, different spheres. But the main point that I wanted to make with this um, with this image is just to show solidarity economy as a whole economic system. Um, so it's because there is a tendency sometimes for people to. Uh, talk about solidarity economy as cooperatives. So cooperatives are great. We support cooperatives, um, but uh, it's just one piece. So as an economist, so this went through vetting, um, went through a whole process with the Center for Popular Economics. So a bunch of economists worked on this. Um, so these are major economic spheres, starting with production, distribution, exchange, consumption, finance, and then governance. So if you look at the outermost circle, that just shows the world or the e whole ecosystem. That's where we start. And then depending on your governance, how you set up your governance and your in institutions and your policies, that's gonna shape your economic system. So in governance, you'll see things like participatory budgeting, um, you'll see various kinds of commons governance, et cetera, et cetera. So that shapes a solidarity economy. So um, right, so zoom out again. So then the governance shapes, in this case, the solidarity economy. So that inside this second um, ring, you'll see, oh, these are just, uh, <laughs> so now Yvonne, you're, you're actually going through the Prezi. So just, yeah, stay there, stay there, that's perfect. Um, so governance shapes solidarity economy. And I'm not gonna go even look at all the examples in each sphere, economic sphere, but you can see that it's populated by all kinds of examples of actually existing solidarity economy um, practices in all of those spheres. Um, and the point is one, that we're talking about systems, not only production, but all, all of the economic spheres. The other point is, if you were to look at this and you could add, there's lots more that we could add. Um, there's a huge base that we can, we can build on. There's a huge base of stuff that, that already exists and that already is working. Some, is, some are very old, like Yvonne talked about. Some are relatively new or they're new takes on old practices. Um, some of them are alternative, uh, some of them are mainstream, um, but there is a huge uh, base upon which we can build. And the point of solidarity, or the project of solidarity economy is to try to take these solidarity economy practices that exist and are working and get them to see each other and to pull together in a common project of building uh, an economy that works for people and planet. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Emily and, and Julia. Thank you both um, for giving us uh, a lot of uh, things to think about and also some background. Um, I, I really like to think of solidarity economies as finally being like that grand unifying theory that I've been looking for. Um, you know, how do, how do all the things I care about from culture to the planet to um, anti-oppression work, 
to direct services, um, to some kind of transformative way in which how we we connect with one another. And as we were kind of zooming in and out, I saw spiritual, right? So it's like mind, body, um, you know, heart, um, and spirit. And and that you know what I really love about some of the ways in which this has been represented. Um, and U.S. Um, Solidarity Economies Network has this, and I've seen this on um, other places as well. Is you know that that there's a space for all of these different things and how they connect. Um, and for me, that means that there are on ramps for everybody, you know, and that's why I really, uh, I know that Yvonne and I, when we talk about this and when we talk with, you know, with you all and everyone else that works in this, this work is that we just, um, want, you know, people to understand that there are different ways in which this connects as, as you, as, as the visual and as, as both of you talked about. Um, so, um, yeah, it is more than just co-ops. <laughs> um, so I wanted to um, uh, ask, actually, um, Julia. The St. Louis metro area has been, a, you know, a real focus area for uh, racial justice awareness and work. Um, uh, you know, um, particularly um, after the uprising in Ferguson and the prolonged work that happened um, that people knew about, and then you know, people um, you know who are in the know were paying attention to. Um, so how does solidarity economy or solidarity economies work? Um, connect to that as a, you know, a concrete example of something that uh, people saw and know some things about you know, when it comes to community in St. Louis and the St. Louis metro area. Um, okay, so that's a great question. Um, I think one of the first things to kind of keep in mind um, when we're talking about a place like St. Louis is that we are one of the most deeply segregated um, cities in the country and you know every city has racism every city has systemic issues um st louis is in in st louis all of those things are deeply entrenched and institutionalized um such that st louis is one of the first places that really um kind of created systems of redlining you know and so taking those things of like those uh um when you're talking about institutional racism the level of of um, sort of repression and oppression that happens to people here is sort of coming at all in all directions. Um, part of that is because St. Louis is still in many ways a southern city, um, but also trying to live out its industrial dreams. Um, and so there's a lot of that going on. And there's also the fact that, you know, like St. Louis was very deeply affected by um, my white flight by desegregation actually um, destroying a lot of thriving black communities. And that's not something that people like to talk about much. Um, but all of those trends factor into St. Louis history. And obviously I can't go in too much into detail there, but um, you know, all of that to say is uh, those, those historical sort of trends and, and the ways in which people are deeply um, repressed here all sort of led to what you can imagine is kind of like a, a powder keg um, and what resulted in Ferguson and in, and most people, you know, media was very conscious in not this, not portraying Ferguson as St. Louis as an actual urban center, um, but looking at it as like, oh, this kind of, you know, sort of freak accident that happened in a suburb of Missouri. Like, no, this is all part of St. Louis and the St. Louis area. So, with those things kind of disclaimers put out there um in terms of how they relate to solidarity economy work uh one interesting thing that most people don't know about the connections between solidarity economy and ferguson work was that the, so first of all solidarity economy st louis was sort of started as a project almost an experiment within another organization um just months before ferguson happened and one of the first things that we we're trying to understand and really wanted to focus on because um, kind of what Emily was referring to that a lot of the people who were initially interested in this were um, a lot of like young white nonprofit professionals working in environmental sustainability um, and kind of climate stuff, which, you know, again, was not necessarily a bad thing, but it was definitely not what the purpose of solidarity economy was. And so when we started to think about how do we shift that perspective into focusing on really um, uh, being led by, being cent centering low income communities and, and black people in St. Louis. Um, we started thinking about what are 
systems that um, oppress and that criminalize people for being poor. And the most visible of those systems, the one that um, we continue to run into over and over again, was um, this bench warrant and uh, municipal court system. And so uh, to summarize it, basically we were finding out that hundreds and basically thousands of people every year were being put in jail um, and being uh, left there sometimes for weeks, sometimes for months, basically for not being able to pay minor um, nonviolent municipal ordinance violations. So a speeding ticket, you know, even sometimes parking tickets, like really minor things that were um, completely derailing people's lives. And so we said on uh, the Solidarity Economy St. Louis's first campaign was actually to address that system and to both clear people's bench warrants um, and to disrupt courts, but also to establish and talk about alternatives that could be put in place um, where people, well, first of all, wouldn't be getting uh, jailed, but also that there would be other systems um, that would kind of restorative justice uh, systems that would be that would be implemented. So all of that was happening just three or four months before Ferguson. And at that time, it was really difficult to talk about those issues because people sort of understood that they were, that they existed, but they didn't understand um, the, the, uh, the fact that other places did not have this. <laughs> um, and it was like a lot of kind of passive ex acceptance and a lot of, uh, a lot of hopelessness. Um, and what Ferguson did is it catalyzed that particular issue and of course many other um, issues around state repression and state violence um, to a point where it became this national issue and you know the Department of Justice was investigating and pointing to the municipal court system and people being jailed um, for traffic fines as a key factor in um, the events that led to Ferguson. So all that's to say that that's a very clear link that um, I think between especially locally solidarity economy work, um, municipal court work. Another um, in terms of, uh, and so then fast forwarding to now, we're seeing that a lot of those same groups that were really engaged, um, that built a lot of relationships during that time that were mostly focused on kind of the resistance side of things. So protesting, um, direct action, even some of the like legislative work, trying to get citizen review boards and that kind of thing to oversee police uh, activity. A lot of those groups um, have either, you know, burnt out or become traumatized from this work um, and or started to seek out alternatives for how to sustain the work that they're part of. And so, um, you know, now almost four years later, what a lot of people are saying is like what we were doing then, um, while it you know definitely made history, was not sustainable. Um, it was not sustainable for people. It was not sustainable for our community, um, and there was not any of that conversation around sort of healing and um, uh, taking and 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 sort of like how to create this new vision of St. Louis that we all had. And so, what Solidarity Economy is doing now, um, you know, obviously this is. We're, we're just one part of an ecosystem of really creative um, work that's happening here. But one thing that we're trying to do is sort of connect people to that vision and say that, you know, we support you um, and we want all of us to work together in sort of co-creating this new city that we that we see and um, exploring all of the new possibilities because so many people here um, after the events in Ferguson are so um, just done, you know, <laughs> just done with everything. And they really see very clearly that the sort of veil has been lifted, that there, um, that there are no other alternatives being given to us by people in power. And so we have to create those ourselves. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, that, that's, I know just a, 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 like a snippet of all the things that you could talk about. So we're hoping that people tune in and, and really, um, check out what's happening uh, in St. Louis. Um, and we'll also put out some more information um, about Common Ground 2018, uh, which is a conference that will be hosted in St. Louis. And I know Solidarity Economy St. Louis is, is uh, playing a big role in, in being that host. So we'll put more information about that. Um, just to remind uh, anybody who's tuning in, um, you can send questions to hashtag Asian Solidarity on um, Twitter, and we will um, try to uh, pose those for the, um, the, our guests in the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, Emily, um, 
So I wanted to ask you um, what um, is um, resistant build and how um, that relates to what you've seen um, with the variety of responses um, and the different movements that have swept over North America um, over the past few years, including Idle No More, the movement for Black Lives, um, all the actions of uh, the Dreamers and, and um, you know, all the pushback against the anti-immigrant, the range of anti-immigrant things that are happening in the United States. I mean, also with Me Too and Time's Up, there's just a lot of different things that are happening. And, and uh, Julia also touched on you know, some of that as well. But could you tell us uh, about re resistant build? Yeah, it's something that we talk a lot about in Solidarity Economy, um, that uh, Solidarity Economy is focused more on the build, right? Like, what kind of practices can we lift up, connect, help to you know, get them on board with a common vision of creating a whole new economy. And so when we talk about like the economy that we're envisioning, it absolutely goes beyond like a traditional mainstream def narrow definition of the economy. And in, in many ways, we're really talking about um, as Parag, as you mentioned, right? We absolutely, um, when we talk about a new economy, we absolutely are talking about new ways of dealing with each other, right? New ways of what is valu valuable and valued and legitimate even within an economic um, transaction, right? So bringing in um, reciprocity and trust and and love is is relevant. So it's it, uh, so when I use you know, economy for solidarity economy, it's really very broad. Um, and so solidarity economy is clearly on the end, focusing on the build. Um, but we recognize that we're never gonna be able to do this build without also the other, uh, the other side, which is the resist, or you could call it organizing, or you could call it, right, it's engaging it with the current system and all the myriad, injustices and oppressions um, of the system, right? Whether it's state or it's corporate or it's power structure or it's the military or it's the police um, or it's, it's, it's racist or whatever, whatever it might be, um, that work of resistance and organizing against it is super, 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 super important. And I, I think of it as um, two legs. We need to walk on two legs. And it's not that every person working on the build end and solidarity economy needs then to become a master, you know, top notch organizer um, and necessarily needs to engage in resistance. Some places do both. Some organizations do both. So certainly um, the movement for black lives has embraced, right, the, the build end. Um, so it, it is, ha and there's a number of of organizations, including right, what the work that Julia is doing, they do, and Cooperation Jackson are good, really good examples where there's the build going on and it's really married up with with organizing and resistance and electoral work. Um, all of that's super important. And I think we ignore solidarity economy, um, ignores the resist at our peril, right? Um, I think it is true that right now solidarity economy is is relatively small um, and not challenging to the powers that be. But if we ever get to that point, right, or if um, yeah, there, the 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 forces in particular, um, the state will come down, no doubt. I mean, if you look at history, if you look at history, um, any struggle um, for. Uh, for, for liberation, right? Which is really what this is about. Um, it, it'll, it'll find the full force of the state come down hard. And so I think we do need to um, uh, see the resist um, as part of our movement and not that um, everybody needs to do both, but we at least need to see each other as part of the same struggle and make those connections um, and support each other wherever possible. I think the other thing that that, that connection does, for, especially for solidarity economy, is it helps to keep us honest. So I will say one thing about the build work, right? So me personally being involved in um, worker co-op development and in um, underserved communities in Springfield, when you get into it, 
right? When you get into the nitty gritty, it is really consuming and you're just trying to um, keep that business afloat. It's a real struggle. Um, and you can, you can um, lose sight of some of those, um, those broader struggles for um, social economic justice. So having that um, interconnection is a way of keeping solidarity economy honest in some ways um, and hold, hold it to account um, so that we don't uh, lose sight of that, of the struggles um, uh, as we are so, so inundated with the day-to-day -day work of building these, um, these practices. Um, yeah, so I think it's super important. It's a conversation that I feel like we, we need to stay on and connections uh, that we need to grow. I guess I'll give one other in illustration. Um, Solidarity Economy Network was very, very, very involved in the 2010. We grew out of the 2007 social forum in Atlanta, um, but we were very, very um, sort of institutionally involved in the in the planning in, for the Detroit one um, in 2010. And there was a lot of resistance to solidarity economy because I would say most of the other organizations on the planning committee were on the resist end. And so there was just a lot of suspicion about, um, oh, you're just a bunch of academics, which isn't true, or, oh, it's just uh, co-ops, which isn't true. Uh, so there are a lot of misperceptions, but also just as a kind of a, 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 a pretty negative assumptions. I think we made headway, but there's there's a lot of work still to be done to build those connections. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, it it just it really does feel like uh, those connections are really uh, vital. Um, and I I know that. From my working with and, and being really in community with a lot of people who are on the resist side, um, it's been a lot of resist. It's been a lot of work, right? It's been really hard um, for people. Um, I mean, it's it's people. I mean, not just the last year, right? But it's like generations, right? There are people who've been um, part of struggle for so long. Um, the day to day struggle of of just making it in poverty and surviving poverty, and then all of the other oppressions within the you know within these systems. And um, and it can feel like what you, you're talking about, you know, um, alternative, a different way than you know this this new economy of capitalism, you know, um, a, a way you know that that can actually be fair and just and, and equitable for for all people. Um, it, it's for some people, you know, being able to connect across those silos of of um, how um, the criminal you know justice system is connected, you know, deeply to. Um, these these different uh, you know ways in which people have or don't have power or means, um, and has become an economic engine for small towns, right? And and understanding those pieces, and then coming back to what do we do today? You know, what do we do today? What do we do tomorrow? What do we do for the next generation? Um, and that's a different way of thinking. Um, that's a different way of thinking. So um, so I really appreciate that. And and I I wanted to just give one quick example of you know people know. Um, uh, the Montgomery bus uh, boycott as as a resistance, as, as an incredible resistance that people talk about. Um, but it was also a sustained boycott for, for many months in which people still had to get to work. And how they got to work is, you know, part of, it's part of a solidarity economy's like understanding with uh, black owned cab um, companies um, offering rates for riders that were equal to the bus fare. Um, Thinking about things in that way is, I think, extremely uh, generative um, and also, like, you know, gets us into a place of uh, not just thinking uh, from a scarcity model of, well, we have to have that resource, so we have to put up with whatever else comes along with it. Um, so um, that didn't happen and that hasn't happened. Um, so anyway, I, I uh, we're, we're getting some questions on... Um, uh, Twitter, which is great. Um, I wanted to ask this one question for sure, which is, you know, what does it mean to be Asian American and working in solidarity economies work or spaces and, or does it mean anything? Um, either of you, if you want to have a conversation about this. Um, I can chime in. Uh, so I guess going back to um, focusing on where I am in St. Louis, 
Um, St. Louis is a very black and white city. And I think it's, um, you can see it in so many ways. Just look at a map of the population. Um, and I think bringing that, you know, not, it took me a while to think about it from a conscious perspective of, of knowing that I am neither black and white and black or white trying to do solidarity work in a very black and white city. And so most of my perspective comes from that. You know, I don't spend, uh, although it's something I'm shifting into trying to, I don't spend a lot of time um, organizing in Asian American communities. Um, and that is both a, partly because of the deep segregation here and because of barriers put up, but also because of, I think, a general, um, you know, a general way that people just think of doing organizing here as leaving out people who are neither black and white um, and putting barriers up for people to engage, especially people who may not speak English. Um, it's like not really something that people are, uh, have made accessible. Um, and so thinking about that um, is, is very interesting to me because I am also trying to be part of um, we there was like an Asians for Asian APIs Asian Pacific Islanders for Black Lives kind of group that was started here during Ferguson and so um, trying now to kind of bridge those two worlds of being um, being who I am and very fully trying to represent the solidarity economy here but also trying to bring in those other perspectives um, and I think you know we were we all I think all of us on this call have had some moments where we have experienced that being Asian does allow you certain access and flexibility and um, almost credibi more credibility than other people. And for better or for worse, you know, being aware of that um, has really uh, helped me understand sort of why I do what I do and also why uh, challenge, challenge me to go into spaces that I might not feel comfortable in in order to, to advance this work. So. So I'll just chime in really quickly. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, we there was some um, a, a gathering of uh, Asian Americans, right? That you you guys um, organized. I, I guess it was at Common Bound, right? And as we went around the room, a lot of the folks in the room, um, though Asian American. Uh, we're not working in Asian American communities. Um, and so that goes for me as well. Um, I, I think, um, you know, it, it sounds like you, you are going to have some people in future webinars who do work in Asian American communities. Um, but I, so I just think that it's a, it's kind of a mix, right, of our personal identities and that um, I think it is very interesting. We were talking about this before before the webinar started that there is a way in which Asian Americans can um, kind of bridge or work in different communities um, more easily than some other groups. Um, <laughs> we're kind of like the type O, the blood type, you know, O, <laughs> that it's a little easier somehow for, for Asian Americans to, uh, to work in different communities. Um, so. I'll leave it there because I can see that there's a bunch of interesting question, more questions. Yes, thank you. Um, there, there is a lot more uh, here, and we we do encourage people to engage. Um, you know, right now we're using um, Twitter, um, the hashtag Asian Solidarity. Um, we are trying to find other ways in which to engage um, these questions and these conversations, and and, and maybe uh, you know something up for discussion if if, if more people want to um, you know. Uh, talk about these things. Um, one question um, that came in um, from Nicole E. Can local or state policy be leveraged to support solidarity economies or is it too entrenched in the current system? Um, maybe we can try to do really quick, quick answers here. <laughs> Anyone who wants to take this one. Um, so I'll hop into that. Um, so policies particularly I mean, there's a lot of policy work going on in solidarity economy, not so much in the United States. Um, there are countries, um, like if you go on the Prezi, you will go to a slide that shows um, uh, countries that have 
national policy platforms um, in support of the social solidarity economy. Um, so just one example in Quebec, right? There, um, there's a policy platform that says that the government has to support the social solidarity economy, and that's across the entire government um, in terms of purchasing, in terms of thinking about taxes, and you know every uh, the whole thing. So there's a number of countries um, that have that, and then there's a lot of city level municipal policies um, ranging, you know, all kind of, you can you can imagine, right? Everything from land use to tax taxation policy. Um, to um, some kind of supports. Um, you know, in the United States, it's not necessarily policy, not quite policy, but the way that we're seeing municip municipalities um, support some elements of solidarity economy, probably the clearest is um, in terms of cooperatives, worker cooperatives and using worker cooperatives as part of a strategy for inclusive economic development. So uh, New York City, by now, I think it's probably seven and a half million dollars. It might be more than that, that they, the city is um, earmarking for worker cooperative development in um, Madison, they earmarked 5 million. I know Richmond, California has hired a co-op developer on the, you know, on their um, economic development strat um, staff. So there's a number of, of cities that are, that are, um, not changing policy, they are uh, directing resources at this. So there's there's actually quite a lot of uh, policy work um, being done. Julia, do you want to add anything? All right. Um, thank you, uh, Emily. Um, so we did have a number of questions. Um, uh, one other, I think, um, there was uh, a question just wanting to learn more about the relationship between solidarity uh, economics and resistance work. I think we talked some about this, um, but uh, there was, you know, if there's anything else that um, either if you want to add um, about the connections. Yeah, um, so it's still a pretty broad question, so I don't know if there was some particular detail that people were getting at, but um, I I feel like we're we're still at the beginning of this this journey and trying to build better ties. Um, I guess one thing that I want to say about it is that I, I spoke probably more about what solidarity economy stands to gain in making this connection um, and seeing us as two legs of a common. Um, strategy. I think the flip side is, you know, on the resist end, and this has been hinted at um, both by Parag. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think both. Um, uh, anyway, so that the resist work, um, the resist work without. Uh, a better idea of where it's going, right? So to it's like going back to the Center for Popular Economics work, where we did a great job of identifying all the problems and failings of capitalism, and that's super important so that people can better know how to resist it, right? But um, knowing where you're trying to go is super important, and actually the process of building, um, building uh, those practices um, means that if you are ever able to, um, if re the resistance is ever successful, then you actually have a base, you have a foundation of operation. And if if you get right, if our, if we have a revolution, but we have no experience of how to run a business, or we have no experience of how to run a, you know, what happens to money, um, that then you know that's that's a problem, right? So. Building as we're engaging in the resistance is really important to the resist side as well. Um, otherwise, if you just continue to resist without knowing pretty clearly what kind of practices you're in support of, you're very likely um, to just end up with reform um, or recreating practices that still support the status quo of capitalism. If that makes sense. I'll stop there. <laughs> Um, I can chime in super briefly on this too. I know we're running late, but um, I think the key word here is, is the relationship part. Um, and 
you know, I think Emily did a really great job of sort of laying out all the different aspects of, you know, what goes in the solid economy. For me, I think the foundation of all of that is, is relationships. Um, and there's so many different ways that people build those. But I think just thinking, you know, when I think of that link here, I don't necessarily think of like different organizations or different movements that are working together or maybe have shared values or whatever. I think of people, I think of individual people who in their daily lives um, do one or the other or both. And the fact that we all have relationships with each other and that we all, you know, um, are able to sort of understand the ways in which we're linked and to build community. Um, I think that's the missing link in all of it. It's just sort of like, you know, we can have the perfect theories. We can have all of the, um, you know, the different, the, the readings and the understandings and be involved in all these organizations if we're not figuring out better ways to actually connect with each other and to actually bring in people from other communities then we're not we're never going to get there we're never going to build the people that we need um so i think it's less thinking about what type of work are we doing and more about like what ways are we building communities with each other um and so yeah so i think that's those are my thoughts on on that question <laughs> Thank you so much, and and thank you both. Um, we um, we want to um, we want to get to all the questions, but we are um, over our time now, and so um, we're gonna just close out. But I think uh, we wanted to really, really thank Julia and Emily uh, for agreeing to do this and, and spending the time to to really um, prepare and and um, present on on some of these uh, you know things that they're working on and thinking about. I want to thank all the people who tuned in. Uh, we apologize for the um, video and sound skipping that some people were reporting. Um, we will have a recording of this that we'll send uh, a link to once it's up and ready um, to everyone who is on the Eventbrite, um, as well as a little evaluation survey. It would be really great if you could fill that out so we can get a better sense of who you are and what you're interested in, and and um, and also make the case that you know more of this uh, kind of information is really um, needed and wanted out there. Um, and uh, we'll have information about um, U.S. Solidarity Economies Network, uh, Solidarity Economy St. Louis, and the Solidarity Research Center. Um, as part of our, you know, sort of understanding of solidarity economies, um, you know, all all work and all labor should be valued. And so we want to also just, uh, you know, put out there that if you have the ability to support this in different ways, we'd really appreciate that. Um, and um, our next um, Webinar uh, will be on April 2nd at 2 p.m. Um, Eastern, uh, 11 a.m. Um, and you can see the visual now, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific. It'll be um, introducing uh, cooperatives, uh, second part of a webinar series, um, in which we'll be talking about uh, a range of these things with um, two uh, really great speakers you can see up um, on there as well. So um, thank you so much. Um, the details for RSVPing in April um, are uh, on the site here. And we'll send it out. And uh, we will have um, information about the listserv on Asian American solidarity economies. Um, and uh, some links, uh, people were asking in their questions uh, for some of the um, information that was shared. So we'll have some links to um, um, some of them that were mentioned as well. Thank you so, so much. Um, and uh, we'll see you in April. Thank you, Julian, uh, Emily, and, and thank you, Yvonne, as well.